Our story begins 65 million years ago in Brooklyn, New York. The Earth is a bubbling stew of primordial ooze, inhabited by overgrown reptiles with thick skins, tiny brains, and big, sharp teeth. Suddenly, the red sky grows dark. Out of the blackness, a meteorite hurtles to the Earth. As the big rock slowly sinks into the Earth's soft crust, a small, cone-shaped sliver of crystal breaks off. Our story continues. In Brooklyn, a mere 64,999,980 years later, a breathless and beautiful young woman tenderly places a bundle on the steps of a Gothic church. She takes from around her neck an exquisite pendant, a unique cone-shaped sliver of crystal, and places it inside the bundle. As she does, we catch a glimpse of the contents. It's a large metal egg an egg unlike any other seen by modern man. As we watch, the egg moves, it cracks, and a tiny, delicate human hand reaches out into the night. Our young woman leaves reluctantly. Darting into an abandoned tunnel held up by rotting beams, she heads toward a familiar and distinctive rock formation at the end of the tunnel. A handsome, evil-looking intruder overtakes her. Where's the rock? Where did you leave the rock? For now, the question will go unanswered. Welcome to our miraculous world. When did the accident happen? It's 20 years later. Today, in fact, in the Brooklyn apartment of Mario Mario and his younger brother Luigi. The Mario brothers. Like their father and their father's father and his father before, the Mario brothers are plumbers. The best plumbers in Brooklyn. The best plumbers in Brooklyn, with very few jobs. Don't use it, don't move it, don't loosen that blanket. You don't want to lose it, do you? Then do exactly as I say. We'll be right there. Mario wrestles Luigi away from his favorite television program. Luigi, we got a broken dishwasher at the Riverfront Cafe. You know what that means? We got work. Wait, wait. On our miraculous world, this guy just found out he's been in another dimension. The only miracle I know is we're still eating when we're going broke. We ain't going broke, Mario. We're already there. Mario, a man with a handlebar mustache, a fully stocked tool belt, and two feet firmly planted in reality, ponders his younger brother's gullibility. Waiting for Luigi to strap on his tool belt, Mario turns off the TV and picks up a tabloid newspaper from the coffee table. I can't believe you buy this miracle hooey. Hey, that's got the article on the missing Brooklyn girls. Yeah, and it's also got one on a scientist who turns brains into cheese. I don't know. Maybe it could happen. Say you drink a lot of milk, but you don't swallow it, and then you shake your head really fast, and for some reason your head gets... I don't know, refrigerated, maybe, somewhere, somehow, there's a possibility. It could happen. Mario points to Luigi's head. You're right. Maybe it can happen. When they arrive at the Riverfront Cafe, they spot the parked van of the multi-conglomerate plumbing goons, the Scapelli brothers. Inside, Mario and Luigi find two burly plumbers cozying up to Pascal, the snooty cafe owner. It's a two-day job. That's if we got the parts you need, and boy, you know how ordering parts can get. Hey, Pascal, you said it was a dishwasher when you called us for the job. It is. It leaks from its bottom. That's a washer, maybe a hose. You're looking at a two-hour job. These guys are trying to snow you. The Scapelli plumbers muscle Mario aside, then convince Pascal that his dishwasher and his life will be better off if he hires them. Pascal gulps, and the Mario brothers are out of a job. Unbelievable. What line of work ain't Scapelli involved with now? Mario Mario will have his rhetorical question answered soon enough. At a geological excavation site near the bank of the East River, construction workers wearing Scapelli Brothers uniforms are picketing. Geology students from the local university peacefully go about their business, sorting tiny pieces of rock and fossil. As they work, a limousine pulls up, and out steps Anthony Scapelli, dressed in an expensive Italian suit. 
Uh, who's in charge of this uh, hole? A beautiful young woman steps into his path. Around her neck hangs an exquisite crystal pendant. I'm the boss here. Well, I'm Anthony Scapelli. I'm the boss uh, elsewhere. And my boys need to get back to work here. How long are you going to be digging up these uh, bones? As long as our court order lasts, Mr. Scapelli. The university has explained how important this site is, and we'll get done sooner if your goons stop harassing us. You look like a smart girl. I'll bet you'll be done by tonight. Scapelli leans in closer to Daisy and whispers, A lot of girls have gone missing in Brooklyn lately. I'd be uh, careful. Not one to be intimidated, Daisy goes to look for a payphone to call the university. As she does, two shadowy figures sit nearby in a parked car. They try to be discreet, but Iggy and Spike would stand out wherever they go. They look just like their names, with long, gaunt faces and an unnatural pallor to their skin. It's quite clear that these guys ain't from around here. He's gonna kill us if you blow it again. Me? You're the one that's blowing it. <laughs> look at you. You don't fit in here. I look perfect. Regular Brookland. You're the one looking stupid. I look sharp. Hey, there she is. Are you sure? Sure it's her. I mean, two arms, one head, two legs. Then let's go. Iggy throws the car into gear and guns it. <laughs> Foiled again. Nearby, in front of the Riverfront Cafe, Mario and Luigi have climbed into their van to leave. But the engine won't start. As Mario opens the hood to investigate, Luigi goes to a nearby phone booth to call home and check their answering machine. In the middle of his call, Daisy walks up, and Luigi immediately hands her the phone. She smiles, calls the university to report her security problems with Scapelli, then hangs up. You okay? Yeah, thanks. I'm just having a few problems. Well, you know, we got a van. Oh, it's nice. Uh, I, I mean, I'm asking you if you need a ride. But, uh, except the van's not working right now. D uh, did I hear your name? Daisy. Daisy. That's nice. <laughs> I never met a Daisy before. I've seen the flowers lots of times. N not that I hang out in flower shops or anything like that. Mario slams the hood of the van shut and steps between Luigi and Daisy. What my brother Luigi is trying to say is, he doesn't know what to say because you got him all mixed up. He'd like it if you'd like a ride, because it would give him a few more moments in your presence. The point is, he has offered you a ride, and if it would help you out, please step into the van. A few moments later, the Mario Brothers van pulls up to the excavation site. Daisy climbs out. Luigi tries to speak, but he can't seem to form the words. Well, thank you for the ride. If you want to talk when you open your mouth, words got to come out. Do you eat? Yes. Dinner? Sure. Six o'clock. We'll pick you up here. Okay. As twilight approaches the excavation site, Daisy is keeping watch. She's worried about Scapelli's threat when a plumber's van pulls up and the door slowly slides open. Luigi steps out. Hi. <laughs> Uh, I was just in the neighborhood. I'm glad it's you. Across the street, Iggy and Spike watch Luigi help Daisy into the van. When the van pulls away, they follow. Inside the Bella Napoli restaurant, Mario's girlfriend, Daniela, quizzes Luigi's new love interest. Okay, let me get this straight. Scapelli blasted and they found bones and what in the rocks? Iridium. Unbelievable. You know what that is? No, but how could something called iridium not be important? It means that a meteor may have hit a long time ago. We think that could be what wiped out the dinosaurs. Wow, there were dinosaurs in Brooklyn? Relax, Luigi. There used to be dodgers here, too. Dinner arrives, and the conversation turns to Daisy's unusual pallor. You should come down to the tannin salon. I get you set up for cheap. You've been spending too much time underground, honey, and I promise, no tan lines as long as you take off that incredible rock you got there. Well, actually, I don't take it off. I know it's weird, but it's the only thing I've got from when I was found. I'm sorry. Found? I was abandoned. 
I grew up in St. Teresa's on Fulton Street. Wow. So you don't know who your mother or father are either? No. What do you mean, either? Because Mario brought me up. I guess that sort of makes him my mother, uh, my, my father, my, my uncle, my whole family. <laughs> <laughs> After dinner, Daniela suggests that Luigi walk Daisy back to the excavation site. Daniela and Mario will drive the van. It all makes perfect sense. Except to Iggy and Spike waiting outside for Daisy to climb back into the van. Instead, they see Daniela. Hair different, clothes different, different height. Devious. She's wearing a disguise. Yeah, I could spot it right away. She thinks just because all these humans look alike, she's going to fool us. Iggy and Spike pull off to tail the van. They follow it to Daniela's place, where Daniela kisses Mario goodnight. When Mario drives away, Iggy and Spike let themselves in to Daniela's apartment. <coughs> Meanwhile, Daisy and Luigi had made their way to the excavation site. Once there, they descend into an underground tunnel and enter the fossil room. Wow! Awesome! While most kids were watching cartoons, I was reading about dinosaurs. I used to make the nuns take me to the Museum of Natural History, and I wouldn't want to leave. I don't understand why, but I've been drawn to this stuff all my life. I feel at home here. Luigi admires Daisy in the dim light as she holds up a fossilized jaw full of sharp teeth. Like, look at this. Guys like him used to roam the earth. What was he thinking before he died? Probably, no, I don't want to die. <laughs> Oh, the proportions of the bones here, the opposable thumb, it's, it's almost as if he was a monster trying to be a human being. It's beautiful. Luigi leans close and is about to kiss Daisy when they are interrupted by sounds from deep within the tunnel. What's down there? The sump pumps. They start toward the noise, but then hear the sound of footsteps coming directly toward them. Dousing their flashlights, they press up against the tunnel wall just in time to see two figures dash out of the pump room and around the corner. Even in the darkness, Luigi can see the letters on their uniforms. Scapellis. Water is flowing into the passageway, and being the confident plumber that he is, Luigi knows exactly how to handle the situation. He runs to the phone and calls Mario. By the time Mario arrives, the water is ankle deep. Strap on your tools, kid. We're going in. Mario, I was on a date. Luigi, when are you gonna learn? Never go anywhere without your tools. They're probably still in the van. Get them and meet me down below. Moments later in the pump room, Mario, in the manner of a surgeon, holds out his palm to Luigi. Isla wrench. Crescent, no. Cumberland gauge. Luigi winks at Daisy and points to his big brother. Piece of cake. Guy knows his stuff. Not far away, two funny looking guys scratch their heads. Wrong again. How many is that we got wrong? Five. Oh, for five. What percent is that anyway? I don't know. Let me think. You know, whatever it is, it ain't good. I'm telling you, he's gonna kill us. Suddenly, Iggy reacts, clamping his fingers into Spike's arm. His nostrils flare. Up ahead. Smell that? Smell it? It's her. I definitely know it's her. Iggy and Spike drop into crouches and move forward in the darkness. Slowly and silently, in a way that's not quite human, they stalk their prey. At last, they spot her. But first, they have to take care of the two plumbers. <coughs> Daisy resists, but she's no match. They drag her deeper, deeper, deeper into the tunnel. Back in the pump room, Luigi is the first to come too. He looks around for Daisy, and realizing she's gone, rouses Mario. The brothers hear a distant voice. The brothers gaze in disbelief. The voice is coming from a wall made of solid rock. As they stare, the wall ripples, and Daisy's face appears through the surface. Luigi! Without thinking, Luigi reaches for her. His hand goes right through the wall. When he pulls his hand back, it's clutching the pendant. Angrily, Luigi thumps the rock with his fist. He's sucked right in. Mario, not about to let his baby brother go unsupervised, pounds the rock. Nothing. He kicks the rock. Nothing. Close to exhaustion, he collapses against it. 
Mario tumbles through a cosmic vortex, a bizarre distortion of shifting dimensions. Then, little by little, shapes become solid, and he finds himself in a chamber sprawled next to his brother. Did we die? No, if we went down below, there'd be accordion music. They follow Daisy's faint voice out of the chamber and through a tunnel. Emerging, they stare in disbelief. They're at the top of a ramp, looking out over throngs of odd-looking people in a dingy, distorted, fungus-covered version of New York. What is this? I don't know. I ain't been to Manhattan for a couple of weeks. Well, looks like it's been a bad couple of weeks. Maybe it's the Manhattan of the future, and we were just knocked unconscious for a hundred years or something. Or maybe it's the Bronx of today. No wonder they tell you never to go up here. Maybe it's a parallel dimension. You know, an alternate world to ours, sharing the same space as us, but totally unreachable, except by tunnel, and then by liquid rock, and... I know, I know, I'm reaching. High overhead, in a lavish high-rise suite, a familiar man-like creature named Koopa looks out over the city. His face brings to mind an unpleasant moment 20 years ago in a dark, deserted tunnel, in a showdown with a lovely young woman who met her untimely demise. Koopa was mean then, and he's even meaner now. He plots his takeover of the world, our world, with his girlfriend, Lena. For 65 million years, our people have been exiled to this pithole of a subdimension, while the mammals have roamed freely on the other side. But soon, the world will be mine. Soon, you'll merge the dimensions, and we'll have everything you've dreamed of. All we need is the rock. And the princess. I need the princess. Just then, Spike and Iggy blunder in. Sir, I've got the princess. She's here. She's being defungused. Good. Now where's the rock? Rock, sir? Yes, frog brain. Where's the rock? He's always forgetting things. Spike. Bad Spike. Now what rock exactly are we talking about? The piece of the meteorite she wears around her neck. I told you not to forget it. Oh, that rock. The, the plumbers, plumbers took, took it. it. Without the missing piece, the meteorite remains dormant, and I cannot merge the dimensions. You know what that means? It means we're trapped in this world with no access to the resources of the other, which means the very end of dinosaurs, the greatest creatures to roam the Earth. Do you want to be responsible for that? Put out an all-points troll. Get me those plumbers. As he speaks, those plumbers are in a whole heap of trouble. Not only have they lost Daisy, but they've landed in a bad, I mean bad, part of town. Luckily, here comes a friendly old lady. You guys from out of town? Brooklyn. Dangerous part of town here, boys. Shouldn't wander around without a weapon. You got one? No. Good. Give me all your money. Wielding a stun gun, this little old lady from prehistoric Pasadena is amazingly quick. She frisks the Marios, tosses aside their useless dollar bills, and settles for the only thing that appears to have value, the pendant. As they try to absorb all this, a tough-looking woman wearing spikes and red leather appears out of nowhere. She jerks the old lady high overhead and shakes the loot free, then activates her air stompers and catapults herself into the air out of their lives and in the direction of the Boom Boom Bar with the pendant in hand. Just when they thought things couldn't possibly get worse, the Koopa Troopas appear. They found their plumbers. Across town, Daisy is brought before the evil Koopa. Who are you? What do you want with me? A favor. My name is Koopa, ruler of all that you see. A few miserable streets and an endless, interminable desert. But with your help, that will all change. Now, I need to find some friends of yours. Plumbers! Look, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to go home. My dear, you are home. At the Koopa Troopa precinct house, the Mario brothers are interrogated, defungused, and booked. Then they're thrown into the slammer, where all the other guilty until guilty prisoners await their fates. As Mario paces, Luigi suggests that he simply mellow out. Mellow out? 
He wants me to mellow out. Okay, fine. I'm mellow. To show just how mellow he is, Mario grabs Luigi by the collar. We're in here because you wanted to save a girl you hardly knew. You said I should go after her. I was talking about on a date, not into another world. The Marios are taken to an interrogation room to meet their Koopa court-appointed attorney. Funny, the attorney looks exactly like Koopa. Boys, boys, sit down. How's prison treating you? Larry Lazard of Lazard, Lazard, Conda, Dactyl, and Cohen. <laughs> Mario pushes aside the man's card and gets right to the point. Who's this Koopa clown? His idiot name's all over the place. We want to talk to that goofball now. I don't think you want to do that. This Koopa clown is one mean, evil, egg-sucking son of a snake. Now where's that meteorite piece? The what? You know what I'm talking about. Koopa lunges forward and gives Luigi's neck a twist. Mario, in defense of his brother, grabs Koopa. If anyone's gonna wring Luigi's neck, it's gonna be me. Mario doesn't know it, but grabbing King Koopa is a great way to qualify for the endangered species list. Koopa decides on the most cruel and unusual punishment of all, the de-evolution chamber. Here comes a demonstration prisoner now. Mario and Luigi recognize him as Toad, a protest singer brought into the police station with them. In the Devo chamber, Koopa straps Toad into a chair, then walks to the master control and turns a dial back 65 million years. See you later, alligator. Grinning, Koopa turns to the Marios. You may understand evolution as an upward process. Things evolve from primeval slime to single-celled organisms up to intelligent life. De-evolution, of course, works the opposite way to simpler forms. For instance, even our most restless citizens can become faithful members of my elite guard, Goombas. The machine stops. The chair emerges. The prisoner is now a dull-witted Goomba. Loyal, lethal, and stupid. Koopa takes another Goomba assistant and sits him in the Devo chair. No, 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 no! Ah! Your de-evolution will be a living nightmare if you don't tell me where that meteorite piece is. The Devo chamber opens once again. No model prisoner, no Goomba. Only a shimmering green slime oozing down the chair and onto the chamber floor. One more time. The rock? Okay then, which of you is first? In a lightning motion, Mario reaches for his tool belt and whips out a wrench. Mayhem. When Koopa loses his footing in the slime, Mario and Luigi push Koopa into the Devo chair and hurl a wrench into the controls. While the Troopas and Goombas rush to rescue their leader, Mario and Luigi race out of the building. Koopa emerges from the chamber intact. Or is he? As he rises from the chair, his men notice that the irises of his eyes have changed. What are you staring at? Koopa's eyes have elongated into the shape of a cat's. Or a lizard. I'll kill those plumbers! But the Marios have ideas of their own. Commandeering a Koopa Troopa mobile, they speed toward the outskirts of Dino Hatton. As they scan the horizon, two other Troopa mobiles pull alongside, ready to open fire. But by the time they do, Mario and Luigi have slammed on the brakes. The brothers watch as the Troopas annihilate each other. Shards of Troopa mobiles rain down like iron snowflakes. Meanwhile, Luigi is busy punching buttons on the dashboard. Alien species escaping from Metro Central. Aliens? Now we gotta deal with aliens, too? Luigi, where are the aliens? They plunge into the tunnel, hoping to dodge the troopers. As they look back, neither of them sees the sign, Danger, Tunnel Unfinished. In a tower high overhead, Koopa considers his takeover plan as he and Lena soak in a huge sunken bathtub. <sighs> There's nothing like a mud bath. It's dirty and clean at the same time. Soon we'll have the rock and a new world to rule together, side by side. Shh. I'm thinking. 
We need the princess. Daisy's the only one who can withstand the force of the meteorite. She was born to it. Oh? And what am I, chopped lizard? We've been together since before she was hatched. Iggy and Spike enter the room, announcing that the plumbers are in the unfinished tunnel, heading for an unhappy crash landing in the Kupahara Desert. Then, that's that. Bye-bye, plumbers. The tunnel ends in a 200-foot drop-off. So we'll just pick through the remains. A little more gruesome, perhaps, but I'll still get what I want. As Koopa gazes at Iggy and Spike, he has a brilliant idea. You two are coming with me. Lena, bring me the princess. He takes his two henchmen to the de-evolution chamber, where he readies Spike for the Devo pod. Iggy is relieved. I always thought he'd make a good Goomba. Goodbye, Spike. But Koopa has reprogrammed the machine to evolve forward instead of backward. When Spike emerges, he isn't fungus. He's something slightly better, an intellectual. Our not-so-benevolent dictator, as it were. Charming ensemble. Koopa pushes Iggy into the Devo pod and repeats the motions. My word, I feel as though I've been transformed. Ah, Ignatius, quite an agreeable transmogrification. To the desert, both of you. Excuse me, that hardly seems logical, does it? Perhaps we should stay and help formulate strategy. Tete a tete, inner circle, that sort of thing. Here's what seems logical to me. If you do not return with the plumbers and the rock, I shall personally kill you. Very good point. Uh, since you put it that way. Interesting syllogism, I think. It works on numerous levels. Go! Above the Kupahara Desert, in an unfinished tunnel filled with fungus, our unknowing plumbers speed toward the free fall of their lives. I can't stop this thing, and I can't see where I'm going. This fungus is gonna kill us. Look out! Mario! We're hitting the end of the tunnel! As we watch, the brother's car shoots out of the tunnel and into the night, trailing strands of fungus. But before it hits the ground, the fungus snaps taut and stretches like a moldy green bungee cord. Amazingly, it holds, and the car is lowered softly onto the desert sand. Just as gently, the fungus releases the car. Hey, was that superior driving skills or what? Wow. So what is the deal with this fungus? I'm telling you, Mario, there's something going on here. I'm serious. Superior driving skills, period. Meanwhile, Lena enters the room where Daisy and Daniela are being held, along with the four other girls who'd been reported missing in Brooklyn. Now let me guess. Which one of you is Daisy? Ah, oh, you have your mother's eyes, Princess Daisy. Daisy what? what? Come with me. Lena leads Daisy into the hallway, out of sight of the guards and other prisoners. Look, Princess, I've been hanging around Cooper as long as that rock's been hanging around your neck. It was your mother's. When Cooper took over, she smuggled it to the other side. Then she died. Just then, Cooper enters. Lena smiles her slimy smile. Oh, <laughs> why, Cooper, I was just telling Daisy about her mother. She was quite an inspiration to some. What about my father? Is he alive? It depends on what you mean by living. What are you talking about? Where is he? Here and there. Stay away from me. Hey, don't fight it. You know you're different. Always searching for your past, where you belong. But you belong here, here, now, with me. You see, you're one of us, descended from dinosaurs, destined to rule. You and I, together. Even Yoshi, Koopa's pet baby Tyrannosaurus Rex, finds this dialogue a little hard to take. He growls at Koopa, but Koopa persists, looking more reptilian by the moment. As his tongue begins to dart in and out, the door opens, and in walk Spike and Iggy. Catch you at a bad time? The plumber's vehicle is unpeopled. Unoccupied. Untenanted. Uninhabited. Vacant. Empty. Which would leave one to believe that the plumbers are alive somewhere in the desert. Get them! If I see you or the plumbers again without the rock, I'll kill all four of you! Koopa stomps out of the room. Yoshi gives him a farewell growl. Then he happily sidles up to Daisy and flops over, waiting to be petted. In the Kupahara Desert, Mario and Luigi wander aimlessly, arguing about whose fault it is that they're stranded. 
when suddenly a dune buggy carrying Iggy and Spike comes bounding over a nearby hill and crash lands at their feet. The occupants are dazed. It's those creeps who stole Daisy! When Spike and Iggy come to, they're upset to see that they've been tied together with drain snakes. Ruffian! Hoodlum! Hooligan! Brigand! Picaroon! We're plumbers! Now start talking or I'll break your elbow joint! Scallywag! Herbivore! Luigi raises his wrench. Where's Daisy? Tell us! She's in the tower, in the Goomba barracks with the others of similar fates. All right, take us to her! It's irremediable. Koopa won't let us back in without her little rock. Wait, th that thing she wore? The meteorite piece. It chipped off on impact 65 million years ago, causing the harmonic divergence between our dimensions. When it's put back into place, the dimensions will reunite. Then Koopa can invade. Your world will be overrun by Goombas. I don't get it. Why doesn't he just come through like you clowns did? Uh, the gateway? Too dangerous, too small, and it's been sealed for years until now, until something on your side must have blasted it open again. Scapelli. We gotta find this rock thing and get Daisy. Yeah, and you two creeps are gonna help us, aren't you? With our new evolutionarily enhanced brains, it does seem the right course of action. The foursome set off into the night in search of Big Bertha. The spiky, red-leathered babe they last saw headed for the Boom Boom Bar. On the way, Spike and Iggy get misty-eyed as they recall life before Koopa under the velvet glove of the Philosopher King, Daisy's father. And you put up with this now? Actually, we never really thought about it. But now, come to think of it, it has become a rather cruel, oppressive place, has it not? When they arrive at the Boom Boom Bar, Mario and Luigi check their tool belts at the door, while Spike and Iggy saunter up to the bar to plot their coup attempt. Nobody seems to notice that the hat check girl has dialed 411 and is whispering into the phone. Hi. You were looking for the plumbers? Well, I think I spotted them. Across the room, Mario spots a familiar face. He approaches Bertha. Name's Mario. I'm your main man, your ram of them, your can of spam. <laughs> Please, hit me again. I've never seen such fluidity of form, such grace. The way your lip curled in that sensual snarl as you rocked back your fist. The way your knuckles tenderly crunched when you brought them smashing into my face. Bingo! She grins and hustles Mario onto the dance floor, where he manages to maneuver the pendant from around her neck. As he tries to sneak away, Lena arrives with the Goombas, just in time to see the crowd trying the latest craze, the Dactyl. It goes something like this. Leap, duck, leap, duck, duck, swerve, duck, leap. Mario and Luigi give it a try, tossing the pendant back and forth. But one toss is low and offline. As Mario dives for the pendant, Lena's sharp heel comes down on his hand. She grabs the pendant. Mario grabs Luigi. The Goombas grab their guns. As the Mario brothers duck and swerve toward the exit, they notice they're not alone. The big babe, Bertha, is in love and wants to help Mario escape. She unveils her secret escape plan, air stompers. How do they work? Bertha helps Mario strap them on and shows Luigi how to load the cartridges. She plants a big kiss on her Ramadan man, then the brothers stomp down. They rocket upward and outward through the skylight, onto the roof of the Boom Boom Bar, and off into the night. Lena, meanwhile, returns to Koopa with her prize, along with two prisoners, Spike and Iggy. You'll be interested to know that these two were at the Boom Boom Bar preaching your overthrow. <laughs> really? I'm very disappointed in you, cousins. Fascist. Oppressor of the proletariat. I have something else for you. Not now. I have saboteurs in the tower. I still have no meteorite piece, and I'm about to lose everything. It's important. We need to talk. Does it have to do with you? With us? Oh, yes. Most definitely. And type up a memo and submit it through the proper channels. Seething. Lena opens her fist and stares at the pendant. She hesitates a moment, then shoves past a Goomba and hurries off. Moments later, she confronts Daisy, while Yoshi watches from the shadows of the cell. Lena pulls a long silver pin from behind her. Hello, and goodbye. Lena lunges for Daisy's neck, but ah. Yoshi is faster. His long tongue wraps around Lena's ankle and pulls her down, knocking her unconscious. 
Daisy escapes into the hallway just in time to confront a squad of Goombas with Spike and Iggy. To her surprise, Koopa's two henchmen block the Goombas and help her escape. Once out of danger, they explain. Princess Daisy, we are your loyalist supporters. We've been on your father's side since his demise. They take her to the Devo chamber, where Spike approaches a slimy, but somehow regal, cone of fungus. Now I realize the following may present to you somewhat of a shock, but... Daisy, may I present you to your father? Iggy and Spike leave Daisy alone with her father. But before she can say anything more, the door bursts open and in spring Mario and Luigi. You okay? I hope coming to save you isn't too forward of me or anything. No, I just... I, I can't believe you're here. I mean, it's hard to believe any of this, but you've gone so far out of your way. Well, you know, I I'm not usually the kind of guy to go chasing a girl. Not to other dimensions, anyway. Daisy and Luigi embrace. And as they do, a strand of fungus drops down between them. Um, well, this may sound a little weird. I mean... I know it's a little early in our relationship, but Luigi, Mario, I'd like you to meet my father. At least, he was my father. He used to be the leader here until Koopa turned him into this fungus. It's an honor, sir. Pleased to meet you, and uh, I want to thank you for all your help. Next, you'll be singing to the mildew in the shower. Luigi. Mario, think about it. The fungus has been helping us all along. Don't worry, sir. We'll have your daughter safely back in no time. Is Daniela safe? Daniela? As Mario listens in amazement, Daisy explains that Daniela is in Koopa City. The moment he finds out, Mario bursts out of the room and into the corridor. Daniela! I'm coming for you, baby! As Mario exits one door, Koopa enters the other with Goombas. They grab Luigi and Daisy, dragging them toward Koopa Square, where thousands of Goombas wait to greet the inhabitants of the human world with handheld de-evolution guns. Meanwhile, Mario eludes the pursuing Goombas and finds the room where Daniela and the four girls from Brooklyn are being held. Oh, hey, 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 didn't I tell you my Mario would be here? Grab that mattress, hurry! Plotting their escape, Mario tosses the mattress into a huge air conditioning vent and the six of them dive on. The mattress goes corkscrewing through the ductwork like an overloaded bobsled. <laughs> Outside, Koopa has arrived at the square with Daisy and Luigi in tow. With satisfaction, he surveys the Goombas and their Devo guns, ready to carry out his diabolical plan. Just then, a Koopa Troopa approaches carrying a semi-conscious Lena and the Crystal Pendant. Very good work. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? How days that start up so bad can end up so good. Koopa quickly revises his plan, indicating that Daisy should take the crystal and return it to its place in the meteorite, merging the two worlds. But he hasn't counted on the Brooklyn bobsled team. With a loud whoosh, the crowded mattress flies out of the ice-covered air duct and into Koopa Square. It lands on top of the Goombas and knocks Koopa for a loop. Quickly, the Mario brothers take stock. Mario's got his girl, Luigi's got his girl, but none of them have the pendant. High above the square, in the bucket of a construction crane, Koopa is making his getaway, the pendant clenched between his teeth. Mario, meanwhile, hops on the fungus and it carries him up level with Koopa. Mario reaches for a wrench and whaps Koopa on the head, jarring the crystal loose. It drops straight into the hands of a diving Lena. As Mario and Koopa grapple, she lets out a maniacal shriek and sprints into the meteor chamber. <laughs> Luigi, Daisy, and the girls give chase. My time has come! The universe is mine! Lena tries to jam the crystal into place, but it only goes part way. As she tries to push it in farther, she finds her hand is fused to the rock. A giant crackling wave of energy shoots out, and she vaporizes. Her silhouette is etched into the wall, like a fossil. Well, that's why Koopa needed me. Not everyone can withstand the force of the convergence. As the others look on, the gateway begins to swirl. Bolts of energy flash deep within it, like a thundercloud. Hey, hey, that's where we came through. Hurry! 
And be careful on the other side. D don't look down. Daniela disappears through the swirling mass. One by one, the Brooklyn girls follow. When it's Daisy's turn, she hesitates, then hurries back into the meteor chamber. Daisy, don't! When she reaches it, she finds the tiny crystal vibrating, slowly being pulled back into its place in the meteorite. Flashes of energy pulse along the chamber walls, and an unearthly noise begins to reverberate through the chambers. Above the square, Mario and Koopa continue to slug it out, each thinking the other has the pendant. But when the noise grows louder, they realize the truth. The rock is in place, and the merge has started without them. They watch in amazement as cars, buildings, and goombas shimmer in and out of existence. They look down and discover that they've begun to shimmer too. Back in Brooklyn, at the excavation site, Daniela tries to convince a news crew that the Mario brothers are trapped in another dimension, trying to save the planet. The TV crew isn't buying it. Neither is Anthony Scapelli, who stands nearby. Those guys will do anything for publicity. Convinced her story is just some elaborate game. The crew starts packing up. But just then, the air begins to shimmer. Suddenly, Goombas appear at the excavation site, armed with de-evolution guns. The New York skyline disappears, and the Koopa skyline takes its place. Mario and Koopa appear, still punching and jabbing one another. This ain't no game. The TV crew decides to stay. Koopa breaks away from Mario and plucks a Devo gun from the hand of a nearby Goomba. Laughing, he turns to Mario. <laughs> it's Brooklyn! Welcome to my world! And goodbye! Koopa fires. Mario ducks. The blast hits Capelli, who turns into a champ wearing a $1,200 suit. Mario lunges for the gun. Underground, Luigi and Daisy try desperately to reverse the merging process. With his plumber's tools, Luigi devises a makeshift lever and tries to pull the crystal out. It's working! As the noise reaches a crescendo, Luigi gives one last yank, and the crystal tumbles out. As quickly as they appeared, the armed Goombas shimmer and disappear from the excavation site. The Empire State Building, the World Trade Center, and the rest of New York shimmer back into focus. Just as suddenly, Mario and Koopa find themselves next to the bone-dry fountain in Koopa Square. Koopa looks to his Goombas for help. You pea brain morons! Don't just stand there! The dim-witted Goombas begin to dance. Luigi and Daisy emerge from the tunnel just in time to witness the face-off between Mario and Koopa. Luigi taps two grooving Goombas on the shoulders and politely takes their Devo guns. He tosses one to his big brother. Mario! Mario levels the gun at Koopa and fires. Zapped by the de-evolution beam, Koopa twitches and trembles. See you later, alligator! The crowd grows silent. The Goombas stop dancing. Everyone looks up as Koopa contorts and falls back into the bucket of the crane. Then suddenly, a very angry Tyrannosaurus Rex rises in his place. Mario and Luigi fire again, and again, and again. Jolted by the beams, the T-Rex begins to shrink and change from lizard to slime. Then, a huge glob of slime oozes from the bucket and splatters into the street. The fungus that used to be king seems to wave then disappears through the cracks of the dry fountain. Suddenly, the fountain springs to life with fresh, crystal clear water. The dry, parched earth in Koopa Square turns lush, covered with grass and sweet-smelling flowers. Luigi turns to Daisy. Come on, let's get home. I can't. I mean, I can't go yet. What do you mean? Daisy, you know how I feel about you, even if I don't really say it exactly right. I, I mean, I, mean, I want to show you. I want to be with you. Look, what she's trying to say is she loves you. But she's got to stay here until she really knows where she belongs. And if you love her, you'll understand. And you'll leave now before your brother strangles you. Luigi kisses Daisy for the first time and possibly the last. Then, each goes back to their own separate world. After a few days, the excitement of the Mario Brothers adventure dies down, and they find themselves alone in their apartment, 
when a pretty visitor in combat fatigues knocks on the door. Daisy! You're not gonna believe this. I believe! I believe! The plumbers strap on their tool belts. Look out, foes of Daisy. The Super Mario Brothers are on their way.